Hi, I'm Leon Gorin, president of PEO Leadership, a peer-to-peer -peer leadership advisory firm. We're an amazing community of CEOs, presidents, and senior executives. Ask yourself, are you learning as fast as the world is changing? It's time for Ontario business leaders to band together for counsel and support. It's time for you to tap into the business wisdom of our peer groups and unlock new ways to grow. I want you to come out of this COVID crisis a better leader and your organization ready for what's next. Take the first step at peo-leadership.com. This morning, we're going to be speaking with Professor Janice Stein, who's been involved with us at PO Leadership for many years. Janice is a founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto, where she continues to teach a number of courses. She's considered one of the top geopolitical experts in the country and is often leaned on as an international relations expert. You've seen her on CBC, CTV, CNN, and the list goes on. So before we begin, this is how we envision the hour unfolding. Janice and I will lead off the conversation for about the first 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. I ask that you post your questions in the group chat. You can do so even through our conversation. And what we will do is reach out to you and ask you to come off mute to pose a question directly to Janice. So on that note, good morning, Janice, and welcome. Good morning, Leon, and what a pleasure it is to be with all of you today. No, it's great to have you. So Janice, kicking it off, I thought we'd just go big. Let's talk about the new world, the reset, and maybe give us some context from a perspective of, break it into two parts, one being the world and the different countries, and then we'll come back into the Canadian marketplace. But maybe go for it on the world side. Um, let me start then with the biggest uh, big pictures here. Uh, which is the increasingly troubled relationship between the United States and China. Um, and generally, when we think about COVID, um, what I notice is that COVID has accelerated trends for the main that were there before. So if we talk about the US-China relationship, that was a relationship that was already in trouble. Uh, and the COVID crisis is making that relationship even more difficult. Um, and I think all of you see that. Uh, last night, uh, Donald Trump said that he intended to ask for compensation for coronavirus victims from China because the virus had in, you know, started in, in Wuhan and spread outside the country around the world. That's frankly an unprecedented kind of claim to make, uh, but that reflects the very, very tense relationship between the two of them. And looking out over the next 18 months, or which is the slow recovery period that I think we'll see, I can't really see an improvement in that relationship. I think it's going to get worse. So for businesses in Canada that indirectly or directly either import from that market or export uh, to that market, uh, there's just a political premium that's going to be paid. Um, second big one, really, and this has been coming uh, for 10 years, is we've seen this since 2009. What we call, and I'm going to put quotation marks around this, what we call deglobalization. Now, that doesn't mean that globalization is going to stop or is going away. Um, that's frankly nonsensical. But what we are seeing is a shortening of supply chains. Uh, a much bigger emphasis on regional economies. That had started uh, long before COVID, but COVID is just going to give that a terrific push forward, frankly. We're seeing trade between Asia and Europe um, diminish um, as countries in their regions turn inward to trade more with their regional partners and shorten their supply chains. Um, North America is the big question here, right? And we, I know we're gonna talk about Canada, Leon, as we go forward. In a normal world, um, the North American regional market would be deepening in a big way. 
uh, the U.S. and Mexico Canada relationship, which already has so many integrated supply chains, would be growing. There is a I'm going to choose the most judicious language here. Um, there is a political premium right now for countries that are working with the United States, which makes it harder for neighbors um, like Canada and Mexico to do what would come naturally here and deepen these supply chains. That's a big one um, over these next 10 months in the lead up really to the US election until we get into a transition and a new, either the same president continues in office or a new one comes in. So I think uh, that's a big one. The Janet, just on the, just uh, when we talk about deglobalization, maybe just going back to US China and, and maybe just the agreement, because I, I know everybody's probably curious about this trade agreement that he had worked out Right. Do you see anything being in jeopardy around that agreement? Going no, okay. no. So, so just let me talk about that agreement for, for a minute for everybody. Um, that agreement that President Trump reached with Xi Jinping after two years of tariffs and um, mutual hostility, frankly, what that agreement did was froze things where they were. Um, in exchange for China agreeing to buy um, really hundreds of uh, billions of dollars worth of American goods over the next five years. And it was an unrealistically high number. Um, Trump undertook to roll back a very small proportion, but the rest of the tariffs stayed in place. So if you look at the US-China relationship, before COVID in January or December of 2019, it already was not the same relationship that it had been two years ago. The level of tariffs had risen significantly um, in terms of the restrictions that one each country had put on the other. We're still in that world. We will certainly be in that world. I think there's zero chance that President Trump will raise tariffs in any meaningful way, regardless of what he's saying about COVID. Uh, there was a US election coming up in November. His most important goal is to restart the US economy. He's not gonna put barriers in that way, but I think there's zero chance that any of those tariffs will come off, Leon. So maybe if I ask, uh, we go a little bit deeper, because I know you and I have chatted about this. The demand from China though, since, COVID-19, I mean, they've now come out of it. They're so-called coming out of it. And manufacturing's back up to speed. And right. a lot of people in the room here probably do have facilities there and they're back running up. Right. But the demand hasn't come back, right? No. And so will that impact also their purchasing power from other countries in the world, which ultimately may affect us? It, it, it goes actually two ways. It's really interesting because China's ahead of us three months, frankly, on this. We're getting an interesting window um, into what our own recovery might look like. So factories are up. Now, here's one big difference. The Chinese government did not engage in the same kind of stimulus spending that governments in Europe and North America did. And the reason they didn't is they have been doing that for eight or nine years. And they've reached their limit, frankly, in the kind of infrastructure spending that they're able to engage in. There's no more room to build highways and put up apartments that are not in fact occupied. So they hit the wall on that. But they haven't provided, there's no CERB in China. There's no worker support program for people who've had to adjust. So that has really depressed demand inside China. And that's what you're seeing. Right. But there's a bigger factor at stake here. And I think it's interesting for all of us to think about. Um, people are really shocked. <laughs> uh, they were furloughed. They were laid off. Um, oh, there's a general, whole generation of Chinese people who have only seen really good times in China. And their spending levels, it was a, it was a struggle to get Chinese consumer spending up anyway because their social networks are not as good. Their social supports are not as good as ours. In the last two years, 
there's been this gradual shift inside China away from manufacturing as, a, um, as the predominant source of growth in the economy to a service economy. They're still behind us, but wow, this is just a shock. And from everything we're seeing and hearing, um, people are reluctant to spend. They're talking about, we'll see how long this lasts, but it tells us something about ourselves too, I think coming out of this. I was saying, you know, do I really need that new suit? <laughs> do I really need a new car? Is this the time for me to buy a new apartment? Um, that's just not happening in China at all. Now it's early days uh, and for sure it'll get somewhat better. But if China, so China faces two risks right now. First is if it can't drive up consumer spending inside the country, growth really stalls inside China. And that is just deadly for the government. The second thing is how long is demand gonna be down in Europe and North America and other Asian markets? Because China is an exporting country. Um, it, you know, China bought our commodities to fuel its factories, which were exporting to the world. Um, and if global demand is down and we're on a slower trajectory for the rest of this year and local demand is down, that is a perfect nightmare for the Chinese economy, frankly. You know, the, here's the deal that the Chinese government make with people in China. We'll give you economic growth. We will give you a better standard of living than your parents had. You will be able to buy things that your parents never dreamed of buying. And in return for that, you conform. <laughs> you keep your politics to yourself. And that was a good bargain for many, many years. Um, but if this has been their worst quarter in 50 years. They have not seen a recession, whatever you want to call it, recession, right. depression of this order of magnitude, they, their leadership is, has to be scared. It just does. So let me, uh, I'm sort of framing it because I'm, I'm touching everything that I think can hit the Canadian economy. So yeah. let's go to something we didn't, I know I didn't talk to you about was oil. And yeah. so, you know, back in November, we, we don't really talk about the Middle East anymore as a factor globally. But you got the Saudis and the Russians who have just about 30 days ago toasted everybody with their fight around oil. And I think it's gonna have a direct impact on our country here. Oh, yeah. Where, where's this going and, and what's behind this? Yeah, you know, that, that remains one of the most astonishing stories of miscalculation. We, we tend to believe leaders don't do that, that they're smart, that they've got good advisors, that they're gonna to listen to the advisors. And then you watch some of these people. I mean, what a misjudgment by Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, that he could that he could raise oil production, and he could drive first of all American shale producers out of the market, which he did, but that he could also uh, control the the oil markets by pushing out less efficient producers, primarily in Russia, or Russia. This, they, Russia is a petrodollar economy. That's all it exports is oil and natural gas, nothing else, <laughs> do or die. And so the two of them engaged in a race for the bottom, frankly, which has only just stopped now. And, um, you know, sideswiped, in a sense, Alberta, um, our oil exports. Um, it is really, I don't know if there's anybody on the call who is from Alberta, but again, for Alberta, this is the most challenging crisis that it's had in living memory, frankly. This is different from a normal dip. Um, the second big problem in this country, as you know well, is that we, Alberta sells its oil almost exclusively at a discount to the United States because we do not have adequate pipeline capacity to export to where the need for oil and the demand for oil is greatest, which is Asia. And it takes a long time in Canada to build a pipeline. We have been struggling with this for years and there's no 
magic bullet here, which pulls Alberta out of the problem that it faces. Now, now here's the good news. Um, demand for oil is depressed in the same way as demand for clothing <laughs> or demand for new shoes um, or demand across a whole sector. It's depressed by the fact of the lockdown, um, the huge growth in unemployment, all the things that are characteristic of a very, very, very deep recession. That demand for oil will not stay at its current levels and nor will the price stay at its current levels. The big question for the oil patch in Canada, does it have the cash reserves to survive um, through the length of this recovery, which is frankly gonna be slow. Now, I don't mean, I don't mean five years slow, but I certainly think any notion of a V-shaped recovery with pent up demand, you know, just lifting all boats as soon as we get out of lockdown um, is not gonna happen. I think that's a great segue into really bringing it home and understanding then, you know, into this transition, what are, you know, let's, in the Canadian context, let's talk about deglobalization because it's gonna open up what could be possibly the winners here in the country in terms of where people should start thinking about focusing their effort, whether they're on the manufacturing side, whether they're thinking about selling services to them. Um, but where do you see that shifting now? So let me answer that question in, in two different time frames, because we are in an artificial period right now, which is the period of the, we're just starting the period of the recovery that will start in the next two weeks. And it's going to be, ziggity zaggity as we say it's not going to be linear straight up but that period can frankly last for 18 months or a little longer and it's really dependent and you see this in the stock markets it's really dependent on when we get a vaccine uh, because the, there will be diminished demand for a whole series of services and products as long as people frankly are afraid and that fear doesn't go away um, until we get a, a vaccine. You see the stock markets, by the way, responding to the slightest bit of good news about an antiretroviral, which the news is way inflated for what the reality is, but that's frankly what's gonna shape the next 18 months. Too. So to talk briefly about that period, how do we navigate through that period? So one big accelerant, which will not go away, which COVID um, just put on steroids is digitization of services. And that's gonna, that's the economy. We all knew, you know, I think back to the, your terrific PO conference, Leonard, on the future work. Yep. That's what we all talked about, right? And that is a fundamental change. And this has just pushed that forward. Um, and so, uh, digital products and services um, are going to pick up steam. There's huge demand for them. They're growing even in the midst of all this. They're going to continue to grow. Um, the health services sector in this country, which is a very, very big employer, um, it's going to be increasingly digitized. We may have broken through the Canadian resistance to that. Um, I think privacy will be defined differently over these next 18 months. Digitization is going to be a big part of opening up because it's going to be a big part of the story of contact tracing, even though our government is not officially talking about that yet. It can't help but be a big part. Um, Canadians have now experienced healthcare delivered digitally at home. Um, and for many people on many issues, it actually works. <laughs> it doesn't work all the time on serious issues. Um, it doesn't work for surgeries and hip replacements and a lot of things we need, but we're gonna see a much more agile healthcare sector and companies and services that can enable that, um, I think will do extremely well. For the rest of us, we're going to have to configure our working space. Um, you know, I work in a university. How are we going to accommodate the need for physical distancing this fall? 
So it's not an impossible thing to accommodate. Are we going to run physical plant for many more hours during the day and on the weekends in order to meet the need of people to stay physically distant until there's a vaccine? That will be true in every week, in every point that the retail sector touches consumers. That's going to be, I think, a big factor. And that's why we're talking about, you know, and, and let, let me make the point this way. For sectors of the economy that have lower margins, this is a real challenge. Um, because if you're increasing your operating costs, uh, take, for example, I mean, I can say this most easily, if you think about a restaurant that you really like, that's in your neighborhood. Well, they have to reduce their tables by half because you have to stay six feet apart. They have to keep their staff, keep their shafts, pay their rent, uh, pay all their operating costs, but their volumes are going to go down. And it's those sectors of the economy, and the service sector is just a huge part of our economy that are gonna to have to accommodate physical distancing that are gonna be really challenged, I think. Um, Janice, what about what you talk about, um, we talk about deglobalization. And when you do that, you start bringing, you know, we talk about supply, having to bring right. supply chains here. Right. Yesterday, you and I spoke about, and we had a doctor on the line around when you really get down to the sources of some of these raw materials, we're always going back to China. So right. we're eventually going to have to start to change yeah. things of manufacturing here. I think that's one big change that COVID did start. Okay. Um, you know, this, this pandemic that we're dealing with right now is a viral pandemic. Um, it's equally possible that the next big wave, whenever that comes, could be a bacterial infection. So one thing Canadians don't know is that every major antibiotic across the spectrum has a component that is manufactured in China. Um, I just saw your face. <laughs> yeah, that's how, and the reason for that is, is a good one from an economic point of view. What we've built over the last 25 years is a just-in-time economy, right? You don't, you don't stockpile inventory, you get just-in-time delivery, you source from the most efficient supplier, and that includes quality, not only price, and you are confident that you can get the component pieces that you need um, when you need them. Well, that broke down entirely in front of our eyes. Um, for masks, for PPE, which we needed in the hospitals, even for antivirals or medication which doctors use to sedate people when they intubate them. And you saw a global scramble. Um, and the stories, very few of which have reached the press, are um, really like we, we were in an economy of the Wild West. People showed up with bags of cash. <laughs> And, you know, suppliers broke contracts and whoever could pay in cash at an airport, the plane, rather than going where it was supposed to go, went to another country. That's what we've been living in. So there is a determination, um, certainly in Canada, in the United States, all across Europe. We're not doing this again. So what does that then mean? It means... Um, returning the capacity to your own country to surge what you think you strategically need. So we have to have the capacity in Canada, for example, to change manufacturing plants from cars to ventilators. We have to have appropriate stockpiles of equipment. Now, where this conversation is now is about the crisis we're living through. That's what we always do. We always fight the last war. But there will be, and I'm hearing this, there will be a much bigger discussion. What does Canada need to think about? And what is the United States? And what is France, Britain? It's all the same conversation. What do they need to think about as strategic? Um, what goes into that strategic basket? And the crawling question is, what are we willing to pay more for? Because a mask manufactured in China is cheaper. <laughs> but we can't get it when we need it.
And in order to rebuild that capacity, and this is not gonna fill the heart of the business community with joy. <laughs> in order to rebuild that capacity, there's no incentive um, for businesses to do that unless they know they can sell what they produce. So our government and, the, and Congress is going to do this. You're going to see this all over Europe. They are going to change procurement policies to favor their own and to guarantee that they will buy what is strategically necessary. Um, and they're going to regulate <laughs> what has to be held in this country. That's okay. what we mean in part by deglobalization. Right. That's a yeah. big change. No, that's very helpful. It gets us thinking in terms of, you know, even where we want to play. Yeah. I, I, this is a leading question, and then I'll, I'll open it up. So we got now moving back to manufacturing. We're bringing it back here, right? Some, so some, it's and it's expensive some. to do. Right. And it won't work unless governments change their procurement policies and their regulations. Right. So bringing it back, we've got higher costs. We got yeah. even on the restaurant example, you're describing what restaurants are going to have to do is increase costs. Yeah. So potentially we've got inflation now. We got a low interest environment. We got basically zero percent interest. So you got inflation, low interest, um, and probably most likely automation, like we've never seen right. before in some Correct. of these places to, to draw their costs down. Right? Yeah. So. It's not only, Leon, just to interrupt you for what's yeah. but it's really interesting. It's not only to drive costs down. So let's take an example really close to home, right, which is the meatpacking industry in this country. Um, we have only three big plants that supply 60 or 65 percent of our market. They're going to be automated 18 months from now. The reason they're going to be automated is not only drive costs down, but if you don't have people on the floor, they're not going to get sick. And those plants are not going to be shut down as the meatpacking plant in Alberta was just shut down for two weeks to get over the incubation period and to sanitize the plant. So it's going to be more than just cost. That's where the strategic element is going to drive some of this. Our food supply so, is going to end up in that strategic basket. Right. So where I'm going with this question is more around, we're all now looking at an economy that's going to come back everyone in this room is looking at bringing people back right. and the workforce is back. Right. And so, you know, at the last couple of conferences, you and I talked and you talked to the group, we talked about there is going to be a shift from, you know, we were essentially at zero unemployment to it right. rising. We are now at close to 20% unemployment. Where's this thing going? Like are, are, as owners, are we going to be bringing these people back? Should we, should we be bringing these people back? Um, <sighs> where should we know? be going next? It's really, that's, I think, a, just a big question, and it's complex, and um, many of you have to, you will be facing these decisions in the next two weeks to a month. I don't think it's longer than that. Um, it may, in fact, be shorter. Um, you have to make a decision about what the demand for the product or the services that you are producing if you see really depressed demand, for, and there can be a number of reasons for it, uh, you look at the real estate markets, right? There is, frankly, right this moment, depressed demand. Now, how long does that continue? Does downtown real estate across the city um, suffer more than real estate, both commercial and private, that's in the suburbs. There are all kinds of arguments we can make, but really being attuned to demand um, in a very realistic way, I think is absolutely critical. We've also crossed another line in this country and it just happened. We've been talking about this for six or seven years and then it just happened and nobody paid a lot of attention. We functionally have crossed the line and we are now providing guaranteed annual incomes to people who have lost their jobs. It's $2,000 a month. Uh, you, it is very difficult to live on this country on $24,000 a month, a year. Um, I don't think that's gonna roll, I don't think that's gonna get rolled back because that was something that we had talked about for years as automation took away jobs. Um, 
if we don't, it, and, and the reason that has risen, had risen to the top of the agenda, if people, that's where the consumer demand comes from, right? And consumer demand may not come only from people, frankly, whose employment provides the totality of their income. We, that was a worry, that was what we talked about with respect to the future of work. I think the future's here right now. I would be very surprised if our government rolled that program back. Wow. Well, that, that leads to a whole bunch of questions that I've got, but I, I want to go out to the audience now and sure. uh, to the members and, and those in the room here. Before we head into the Q&A portion of this webcast, first, a brief note about PO leadership from one of our members. What I love about PO leadership right now is how well our members are supporting each other and rising to face the COVID-19 challenge. Paul Zadorsky, Senior Vice President, Crayola International. Business is all about being able to rapidly adapt to change, but how do you learn as fast as the world changes? PEO leadership lets you tap into the collective wisdom of some of Canada's top executives. Having that peer group and broader leadership community to lean on, it makes all the difference. The time to step up and lead is now. Go to peo-leadership.com. Um, Kelly, I'm going to use your help here. So uh, we have a question by Tom Kennedy. Tom, if you can come Hi. off. Mute. How are you? If he's there. Let's see if I've got him here. Nice to hear from Tom. <laughs> All right, I can't, if he's- There he is. Hi, Tom. Hi, um, nice, nice to see you and thank you very much for your comments, Janice. Um, the question really is we're, we're driving two things really fast at the government level. One is we're driving our debt levels up, national and provincial debt levels up. Yeah. Um, and secondly, there's an employment issue. We've got a very large number of minimum wage employees, some of whom we've imported into the country and others uh, we're here to start with, but a significant number of minimum wage employees, particularly in the service sector, as you described. Yeah. We've also got people in their 60s and and, and 70s, the ones that everyone complains are hanging on to their jobs that I don't think are going to be rehired yeah. because you don't need to. What's the government policy going to do that addresses those issues? So, Tom, you just asked a great set of questions, and here's what I can tell you. Um, government's wrestling with all of them right now, and there are no answers yet, right? Um, the people who rolled out these programs that would normally have taken a year and did it in 72 hours are so busy right now and so with managing everything that uh, there are no firm strategic answers yet to the questions that you ask. So, but there will be, I think, coming over this next six months. We're very in the very early policy stage on this and nothing is decided. You know, let me let me say on behalf of the 60 plus year olds, um, that is a huge question. The, uh, in this 18 month recovery period, there may be businesses that say to their 60 year olds, don't come back plus, don't come back physically because you are at too high a risk uh, as we open up more and more. Um, work from home if you can. Um, and if you can't, um, I, we're really sorry. Um, and that's a real possibility. Now that's gonna run into a whole set of challenges as you can imagine. Um, but it's, it's I, can, I can foresee um, which, oh, the government of Israel let everybody out of lockdown except people who are 67 plus years old. They said, you stay home. <laughs> Because as they are, you know, it's an unprecedented kind of decision. And the reason they did that is, okay, you're the ones that are going to swap the emergency rooms and the ICUs. We don't want you <laughs> out. So you stay home. And there's no question. I think you're absolutely right. The jobs of some of those people will disappear, frankly. Um, and there's probably more adequate financial supports for people at that end of the spectrum than there are... Um, for very young people who are going into just a god-awful employment market uh, for the next 18 months. God-awful. Um, the, the second one really is about service workers and all crises expose things to people. 
we knew it was true, but nobody really wanted to look at it, right? So who's kept working throughout this whole crisis, as you put it, Tom? Personal support workers in old, in long-term care facilities. I don't think the average Canadian had any idea um, of the working conditions and the pay rate until this came out. People stocking grocery shelves. Um, and in, in the retail sector that stayed open and served Canadians during this whole period, frankly, at risk to themselves. They didn't have the appropriate gear to do this. I think there will be um, a strong consensus coming out of this to raise those wages. You can't say to a personal support worker, you can only work in one home. You can't move back and forth between them. You can only work in one home, but we're not gonna pay you uh, enough to have a living wage. And that, of course, is a sector of our economy that's only gonna continue to grow. We are aging. This is a 20 year problem that we have in front of us. So some wages, um, and actually the lowest paid in uh, many of them will, I think, actually go up and we're seeing province of Ontario, Doug Ford saying, we are gonna pay these personal support workers more. Um, so you're gonna, I think there will be um, an increase in wages at the very bottom of this, a leveling out. And that's historically what's happened after every pandemic, by the way. Finally, a bigger question, what proportion of our population, of our working age population is gonna be employed? Leon will tell you, <laughs> less as we move into an increasingly automated economy. And that's why um, we're gonna have to have a different kind of social support. So put this all together. The government's borrowed, like they haven't borrowed. Um, it, the last time they did something like this was the war, and that was a, a five-year period. Uh, demands for government supports are gonna grow in the vulnerable parts of the economy. There is no alternative to that. And these programs aren't going away quickly. Um, the one consolation here is the cost of money for government is so cheap right now that the financing costs of this for the, for, for the near term future are not crippling. Leon's worried about inflation. I'm worried about stagnation. Um, because you get, you, you know, it's not only wages that drive up inflation, it's demand. It's markets where there's not enough supply. It's difficult to foresee that over the next 18 months. I'm much more worried about what Larry Summers called secular stagnation. Japan, because um, that's what Japan has experienced for 20 years. And that's why governments have moved in as fast as they could to try to stabilize the net. And they're gonna have to do that until we're, the recovery curve is clear to everybody. Probably not the answer you wanted, Tom. Huh? He doesn't look happy, I can see his No, face. I can see he doesn't look happy. <laughs> Janice, just on the note, it sounds like you're telling us government's not going away no. very quickly here. No. As a percentage of GDP in terms of what they've just stimulated the economy, is it not like, it's, uh, uh, did I read this wrong? Was it not over 45% of yeah. debt now as yeah. a percent? So, yeah. I it's mean. It's huge. It's huge. It's we, as I said, the last time, relatively speaking, we can think of anything like this was what governments did in World War II. And let's remember what World War II did, folks, okay? The war started and governments then spent, got factories up and running to make equipment. But what it did was finally lift economies out of depression. It's not FDR that ended the depression. It was World War II where massive government spending flowed into the economy, created jobs, and lifted the world economy out of depression. We're, you know, I, I will wait to see the numbers. I don't know what label you want to put on this. We don't want to think about it too deeply. Yeah. Is it a D? Is it the biggest star we've known in living memory? It doesn't really matter. Right. Okay. Let's go to another question here. I've got Bruce McDonald um, out there. Bruce, if you can come off mute, that would be great. Absolutely. Hi, Janice. Hi, Bruce. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. 
<laughs> um, just, I'm just curious as to your thoughts around what you think this is all doing to, you know, the, the timing of our next federal election. We've got two parties right now that, yeah. that don't have leaders and right. are in, in campaigns or not even started campaigns that much, really. But I mean, I think there was at least two of the conservative candidates had said they were planning to bring the, the government down almost as soon as they got into yeah. office, if, if they were in, they, as soon as they got the job. But yeah. I'm curious to hear what you have to say about that, because it could really lengthen this minority government. Yeah, I, I think there's no question that this crisis lengthens the life of this minority government. And I think from your question, Bruce, you think so too. Um, you know, a new leader will be chosen in May, hopefully um, by the Conservative Party. That leader needs nine months, um, usually, uh, to take hold of the party, to raise funds, to develop policy, to put a brand on things. So normally, anyway, probably early 2021 would be the likely time for an election. Now, add on to this the low tolerance that publics have right now for partisan politics in the middle of a crisis. And one of the, one of the things we've seen really compare us to the United States and feel good about ourselves, right? We got Doug Ford working hand in hand with Christian Freeland and Justin Trudeau and Jason Kennedy. I mean, this is a really terrific performance by our elected leaderships. They left partisan politics at the door during the worst of this. Now, um, will partisan politics come back? For sure, <laughs> they'll come back. But they're not, I think, for um, the Tories would need the support of the NDP or the Bloc to bring down the government. It's inconceivable they're going to get that support as long as there's no, as long as we're still um, facing a very tough situation, Bruce. So I don't think we're going to have an election. Let me go out on a limb here. Uh, I don't think we're going to have an election until 2021. Terrific. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce, for the question. How about going to Rob Elder? If uh, Rob, you can come off mute. Hi, Janice. Hi, um, Rob. Thanks, Leon. Yeah, I, my question is about, uh, they're talking about the staged recovery and how the last stage is going to be bringing organized sports, the arts, all these right. big, big ticket um, multi-person participation groups back together. Right. I'm wondering how these, uh, this world is going to survive this kind of uh, lack of uh, participation. The art gallery, the, the museums, the TSO, the COC, MLSC. What, what's, your, what's your take on all of that? You know, that's a really great question. Um, as a baseball fanatic, I am barely alive as spring comes <laughs> and there's no baseball. It's just driving me up the wall, frankly, up the wall. And, you know, I put aside all my good common sense and I say to the, and, you know, get these players playing in two stadiums with no fans and how close is the hitter going to come to the catcher? And if they both wear masks, how big is the risk? And test everybody before they go on the field. Just do anything to bring baseball back. So, and I'm actually, I haven't written off the 2020 baseball season yet, but this is an absolutely unprofessional comment I just made. It's all about what I want to happen. <laughs> Yeah, but you're right that sports, music, concerts, um, art galleries, these are really important to people when they're facing tough circumstances. I, I can't tell you the number of people who've talked to me about the huge gap that the cancellation of sports has left for them in their life. Um, the business model for them is broken. <laughs> if they cannot have um, large numbers of people come to events, frankly. And that's pushed out. That, I really believe, is pushed out until we have a vaccine. So what happens to the Stratford Festival in Canada, which is you know, one of our most important and oldest institutions? Does the government let that one go broke? Um, because it cancels its 2020 season. I don't believe it will, but that's where you see in this 18-month period 
government intervention, not you know, in the cultural sector of this economy, to allow institutions that are really important to Canadians to survive this period until they can open up next year. Um, that's why I, I, I hear what you're all telling me and I hear what you're telling me about the size of the government involvement in the economy. It's yeah. just not going away until we get a vaccine. Thanks, Rob, for your question. I'm going to go to uh, Les next. Hey, Les. Les. Hey, how are you? Good. <laughs> this time I agree uh, with everything you're saying. Oh, there. wow. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> with one slight upset, uh, exception, well, uh, one little filter there. Bringing manufacturing um, back to Canada for non-essential items. Just for essential, I said. Oh, okay, because I think um, for the type of things like we do, it's just, uh, in, there's first of all, uh, even in our warehouse, we can't get $15 an hour workers yeah. uh, to, to show up. So, um, and we tried over the past six months to move to Vietnam and all that sort of thing, but China is just too developed and too interdependent even with places like Vietnam. So I think those manufacturers, despite even if the duties double, yeah. will remain in China. So right. that kind of manufacturing, which is the vast majority of manufacturing, right. will re remain being global in the That's global. That's why I said it's a big mistake to say that globalization is going away, right, which right, is, okay. right? So I, we still I, don't disagree. No, and I would only add to what you said last, even bringing back strategic manufacturing is hard yeah. for all the reasons that you just mentioned. And that's why that's only gonna happen if governments change procurement policies. What I do anticipate is the US government is gonna change its procurement policies. So it's gonna make it harder for Canadian exporters to get for, for essential products and services to get under that now. Um, and, and that's what I mean by this is gonna be um, a more bordered world than we had before COVID. And, and the part B of that is the disincentive when you create a social safety net, particularly among young people to, to, to work. So we're having a problem in New York State where we have our warehouses and here in Toronto, they just got their checks and we need uh, for e-com warehouse workers and they don't want to do it. So we're getting, ex we, we're getting pretty much recent immigrants yeah. still showing up yeah. at the warehouse and zero Canadians and yeah. zero New York state natives, you know, too, yeah. showing up because they just got their checks. Right. So again, you have to ask yourself, I think there's two big questions that you just put on the table last. One is um, how long can you, if you're single, can you live on $24,000 a year? Yes. If you have a family, no, you can't, right? And so just having gotten their checks once, I don't think is necessarily a good predictor of what's coming because it's fairly low. I think the second question you put on the table is a huge one for this country. The United States shut down immigration. Um, that fits with Trump's agenda. Here's a moment, I think, where um, we could really reap huge strategic benefit if we're smart about it. Um, you know, in my business, in my field, which is the university, uh, graduate students from around the world are now shut out of the United States. Mm -hmm. We can get the very best people in the world to come here. Um, and when the best people in the world come here, they stay here. And what we have to do, frankly, um, is get visas and, uh, and, and allow people to quarantine for two weeks when they come to this country. So, and, and we've seen, by the way, the huge leap forward that we've taken in Canada in the digital products and services industry has all been fueled by strategic recruiting and strategic immigration. I hope um, that the business co community speaks up loud and clear and says, we need this, this is the future of our country. We need this in these specific targeted areas. We can manage the quarantining of people who come in in a really sophisticated way. 
But this is, I think, if you ask me what the strongest strategic advantage Canada will have, it's if we step up now and do that when the rest of the world is closing down to really talented people. Agreed. I hope you're right. You. But all you folks are going to have to weigh in on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Les. I'm going to go to Teresa uh, next for the next question. Teresa? Hi, Janice. Uh, Hi, I have Teresa. a question about... Um, you know, governments usually in economic downturns provide stimulus dollars or stimulation through the investment in infrastructure. Right. Um, the infrastructure focus for the last decade has really been on mass transit. Mass transit poses huge risks um, in trying to uh, deal with transmission. Yeah. And so what does, you know, wh where does government put this traditional solution in the spectrum of things? Uh, I mean, active transportation transportation has an opportunity. The roads need work, um, but if that's you know those those have limitations to the numbers of people that it can move. So what do we do? So that's that's uh, just a great question, Teresa. And you know, the government set up the Canada Infrastructure Week um, for when it came to office. And full disclosure here, Michael Sabia has just been made chair of that board and he is the director of the Monk School. So I'm thrilled because I know what an extraordinarily able person he is that he's taking this on. But here's the V in the road that we're coming to. Um, the virus has done two things. It's fed people's fear of density, right? Um, at least in the short term. So people who are, and these are the poor, <laughs> not wealthy, but people who are poor and live in crowded conditions in big cities have been more vulnerable. Um, and you, the other side of this you see is the more affluent populations have left the cities and gone to the countryside um, to shelter in what they consider safer environments. If that push toward de-densification takes place, there's going to be huge consequences, many of them negative, for transportation and frankly for climate change, which could swipe us in the same way. It doesn't take a, a lot of imagination to imagine that the next big crisis that brings us to our knees is a climate-induced crisis. Very closely related to that is public transportation. Ridership on the Toronto Metro is down 90%. It is catastrophic, frankly, and I don't believe it's gonna come back to anything like what Toronto Transport needs until there's a vaccine or a very, very effective therapeutic treatment for the virus. People will be afraid. So what do you do with, trans with infrastructure spending? Well, you actually have to increase, first of all, our bridges and our harbors are in deplorable condition in this country. We all know that. We're, we're a third world country. <laughs> Spend some time in China and you see what a first world infrastructure is. Ours is third world. So there's a lot of absorptive capacity. And I think Michael's appointment of, as chair of that board is a government recognition. We have to get this moving. We have to get these funds flowing. We have to get these projects out the door, which we're not good at in this country. But beyond that, how do we deal with the question of public transportation in this country? Do we double its capacity so that it's less crowded? And that kind of investment you make now for two or three years from now, and you double its capacity so people are not jammed in. Anybody who's ridden the subway in at rush hour in any city in Canada knows what that feels like. And you say that's the future because we can't afford to increase um, the number of cars that are already clogging our cities and costing us billions and billions of dollars um, of loss of productivity because of the time people are spending in cars. That's going to be a hugely consequential decision that's going to have to get made in the next six months, frankly. Are more people going to work from home? And are people going to be happy to live in the suburbs and avoid this whole issue at all? They don't want to commute in their car and they don't want to take public transportation. So are they going to do what we're just doing now and come in one day a week? Is that going to be okay with the president and the CEOs? Uh, all landlords are not going to be happy with that answer. The commercial <laughs> real estate sector in this country is not going to be happy 
with that answer, right? I, as we're, we're starting to get pressed for some time here, and I, I, so I know there's questions that are coming in. I, I apologize if, if I don't get to your question. Janice, we got to get to the U.S. dollar, dependence on the U.S. dollar versus Canadian. Your insights or thoughts on so where here, are we going? Here's the irony. Um, and it's, it, uh, let me, again, try to be careful with the words that I use to describe the performance of the U.S. federal government in the management of this pandemic. I actually can't find words awful enough <laughs> to describe it. It's the only thing I can say. And the sense we all have of where the United States is right now in its public performance, chaotic, mismanaged, underperforming, the best scientific establishment in the world, um, and yet you deliver a performance uh, of the kind that we saw in New York. Um, that having been said, every time there is uncertainty, I think you asked me about gold, um, and I said, it's not gold, it's the US dollar. There is always a flight to the US dollar. This paradoxically strengthens the role of the US dollar as the world's reserve currency. The renminbi is not even in the game. Um, it, as a result of a series of public policy decisions that China's government made. The Euro, we all know the challenges that um, exist in Europe right now around the Euro. So we are gonna see the US dollar come out stronger um, for the next several years until we come out of post crisis period, stronger as a reserve currency and stronger with respect to everybody else's currency, frankly. That's great, thanks, thanks for the insights on that. Um, you know, I'm gonna skip or the, the Trump name. We're just not gonna talk more. I could talk about US election, but we don't even have time. Six months from now, looking back, what will be the biggest surprise that we miss? What will be the biggest surprise that we weren't paying attention okay. to? Better That's word, a yes. great question. Um, what's going on underneath the surface that we're not really paying attention to? It's such a hard one. Uh, <laughs> I, I, let me just put it, I, I, it's a hard one for me because I know what, I, let, let me change the question a little bit and say, what am I watching, right? Okay. I am watching two big factors. Huge acceleration in the digitization of services, which are going to reshape um, the economy. And as I said to Leon when we were chatting privately, this rewards the nimble, the agile, who see opportunities. And there are, of course, opportunities right now, as there are every time the uh, crisis occurs and we readjust. So that's one. Secondly, a fundamental change um, in the role of government in the economy and in the social system, a much bigger presence than we're used to. The notion that markets can do it all, not when you look at the market for masks, it didn't do it all. So what's going to really matter here is whether governments get this right or not. Um, and government, I, government is going to be a much bigger part of your life than it has been in the last 20 years. That's great. That's thank you. So I... I see someone else is asking a question that I was just going to throw out there. Our North Korean leader, is he alive or is he dead? Oh boy, is that a mug's game? <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, the only people who, I'll tell you who knows the answer to that question, okay? The people who run the heat seeking satellites and, and can tell you who's moving on any block. So any good intelligence agency in this world, including in Washington and Ottawa and London, know the answer, frankly, to the question. Public does not. Um, I would, you know, it's just a hunch and nothing more. This is just a guess. I have no good information. The only way I could answer that question with any class, with any confidence if I had access to classified information, my hunch is he is. My hunch That's is great. He is. Well, Janice, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us. It's been a great oh, it's session. Such a it's pleasure. Fantastic. And everybody stay well. 
And I think it's really important to see the opportunities, to think hard about the opportunities. You know, we had the greatest economic philosopher in our country, Wim Gretzky, because he told us all, you skate to where the puck is going. And this is a moment where the trajectory changes. So, the, you know, recognizing the tragedy of all the people who died and all the people who've lost their jobs, this is still an, a, a moment of opportunity for you as business leaders and for this country. And it's important not to forget that. That's great. Thank you for those wise, wise words. So in closing, remember, if you're interested in, in the Way Forward live webcasts, uh, please visit us at poleadership.com. There's a hyphen between PO and leadership. You'll find a number of our recorded past webcasts that have included Professor Rosabeth Cantor from Harvard. And we've got another a number of them coming forward uh, next Friday, including Professor Michael Beer from Harvard speaking about fit to compete in this new landscape. So I'm wishing you all a fantastic, safe, healthy weekend. It's going to be nice out there. You got to get out, but you got to social distance. So wishing you all well. And that concludes our session today. Take care. Hi, everyone. Bye. Everyone.